Good evening and welcome to our webinar. I'm Chris McLaughlin, Secretary, IET Ireland Network. I'll just mention some items in advance of the presentation commencing. If you have any questions, you post them in the Q&A box below and Geoffrey will take them and answer them from there at the end of his presentation. Note that questions can only be taken from the Q&A box. At this stage, I will also post a link to the CPD cert in the chat box and you can click and download it from there and add your name to it. And just to mention that this webinar is being recorded. So without further ado, I will invite our uh, chairperson, Ching Man, Ching. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. And um, uh, our speaker for this evening is Dr. Jeffrey Gossel. Jeffrey is a principal grid engineer with DP Energy Group, where he worked on the development of offshore wind farms in Ireland. Jeffrey holds an advanced degree in engineering and has previously worked with the Tyndall National Institute, Air Grid and Gas Network Ireland. He has over 20 years of industrial experience. Jeffrey is also a member of the IET Island Network Committee. Now, I'd like to hand over to Jeff. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I'm not going to share my screen. Okay. Machine screen share should be working. So you should be able to see my first cover screen or my first cover slide. That's fine. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I suppose the first thing to do is to um, thank everybody for giving up of their, their time this evening. So I'm going to run through a few slides that cover uh, the topic of the energy sector in Ireland, the movement towards offshore wind, uh, where we are at the moment, and I suppose the potential for Ireland. So the first thing I'm going to do is give you an overview of the presentation. And the first thing I'm going to look at is maybe the target, the government target, the Irish target, maybe some bigger picture, our changing world. Um, the projects that I'm involved with, with DP Energy Group and Iberjola. Then have a look at Ireland's energy mix as it is today. We'll, we'll move on to, I suppose, the success story that has been onshore wind in Ireland. We'll move on and have a look then at potential energy sector coupling, how we can use wind to help with the decarbonization of other sectors. Have a look at offshore wind at a high level, and then move on to the national context with the roadmaps, the challenges, and the opportunity. So firstly, I suppose the big picture is in Ireland, the government has set a very ambitious target of 80% of electricity to come from renewable sources by the end of the decade. That is coupled with another, I suppose, very ambitious target, which is 7,000 megawatts or seven gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, um, which again is coming up from where we are today with approximately 20 megawatts of offshore wind. So that's the big picture. And if we have a little, I suppose, consideration of, of, I suppose, our changing world, everybody is familiar with the concept of climate change. And climate change is probably the greatest uh, issue of our time. It's a very, very complex issue, how to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels while simultaneously lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in the world. So it's, it's a tremendously difficult problem to solve. So what I'm showing here for me is a very powerful image. And um, this is Rostell and Dolman. It's not too many kilometers from where I'm sit sitting tonight in Cork Harbor. And this is, I suppose, a, a Dolman that when we built uh, at least 6,000 years ago was built on a flat plain, but sea levels have risen since. Um, sea levels rose continuously at the end of the last ice age and have been constant for maybe the last 6,000 years. So when we as a people built this, uh, probably one of the most important structures, um, had no idea that the sea would rise and the sea would swallow it. And if it wasn't in such a sheltered part of the harbour, it may have been uh, overtaken by the waves over the years. So to me, this shows that basically climate change is real. It's a constant. It's a part of the world we live in. Um, the sea levels haven't been as high as they are now for at least 100,000 years. But the difference, I suppose, between where we are now and where we were in the past is that if you look at the, I suppose, bottom of the, the slide here, we have this, this lady sitting on the dolmen maybe 100 years ago. 
would have had no idea that when she went home and maybe on her Christmas day, a lit her fire was actually contributing to that dolmen being submerged still further. So we, we are the first, I suppose, generation that has realized that, I suppose, the IPCC report has told us that it's unequivocal that human activities is causing and is uh, contributing to climate change. So we're very much the generation that has, I suppose, woken up and, and smelt that, that the house is on fire. We need to take immediate action in order to make sure that, I suppose, future generations are, are safeguarded and, and our home is safeguarded. So that's the big picture. Um, where I am is with DP Energy Group. And for anybody not familiar, DP Energy is a renewable developer. We're headquartered here in Ireland. We have, I suppose, offices internationally and have been developing internationally. One of the first, I suppose, in the wind industry in, in existence for 30 years and very much a sustainable ethos. Um, so DP Energy has, uh, I suppose, partnered with Iberdrola uh, for a joint venture for offshore wind projects in Ireland. And Iberdrola, for those of you who may not be familiar, again, is, is one of the largest renewable energy producers in the world, is very much committed to climate change, is a very green ethos. So you have, I suppose, a, a union here of, of, of like-minded parties. Again, Iberdrola, again, I suppose, ranked first in um, Renewable Energy and Human Rights Benchmark 2021 for anyone who wants to look that up. So the top renewable energy developers. So you, you have, I suppose, two companies that have a green ethos and, and similar value system looking to do, I suppose, what's good for, for the climate. Our portfolio of offshore wind projects, I suppose we have three projects in active development. We have one off the West Coast, one off the East Coast, and I suppose one off the South Coast. So we are the first uh, phase two developer, and I'll touch on that later, to have published environmental impact assessment scoping reports. So they are effectively uh, very substantial documents. They're publicly available for anybody who's interested. If you look that up um, or go onto any of the project websites, you'll find out more. So that is a very high level is, is where I am and um, what we're doing. So having a look at, I suppose, some of the bigger picture from a national context and the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland has produced an excellent report, so Energy in Ireland, which looks at where our energy is coming from, where our energy is going to. And on this particular slide, which again is borrowed from the uh, Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, you can see that the vast majority of Ireland's energy is coming from fossil fuels. We have 45% coming from oil in 2020, followed by gas at about 35%, whereas I suppose renewables are 13% of the complete um, energy requirements for, for, for Ireland. We have, I suppose, on, sh on screen there, it's describing where it goes. So it goes to industry, transport, residential, etc. Now, the renewable percentage there, 13%, is, I suppose, falling slightly behind where Ireland had hoped to be by 2020. We'd hoped to have a target or to hit a target of 16% as per the Renewable Energy Directive. But unfortunately, due to, I suppose, a, a lack of renewables in, in heating, particularly, we, we fell short there. Um, on the bottom right hand corner of the screen, I'm showing a picture compliments of the Defence Forces of the Kinsale Gas Terminal. So one of the reasons I wanted to show this was to show that Ireland has a long history of, I suppose, offshore energy projects. The Kinsale Gas Terminal was in existence since, I suppose, the 70s, the late 70s. And what served um, as the primary supply of gas for the entire nation. Uh, for many years. Um, in When the gas field was depleted, it served as Ireland's only gas storage facility before being recently decommissioned. Um, so what I want to show here is that basically that there is a history of offshore energy in Ireland. Um, and as well, I suppose this, this field holds potential for the future for potentially being repurposed for, for hydrogen storage or, or similar. If we talk now specifically about energy in our electricity mix, what I'm showing here, if you draw your attention to the right hand uh, side of the screen, most of you might be familiar with, uh, I suppose, 40% um, renewable electricity, which is, I suppose, a very um, substantial amount of electricity coming from renewables and something that Ireland can be justifiably proud of. But from the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland report, when you dig into it a little bit, you, you find out that the primary energy mix is quite different. So by primary energy mix, I mean the amount of energy that it takes to supply the energy to the end user. So for example, from an electricity perspective, even though 42% of the electricity at your plug at home might be renewable, um, the supply of energy to that, only 29% is renewable, 70% comes from fossil fuels. 
A uh, way to, to think about that is perhaps, I don't know what part of the country you may be in, but if you're, for example, sitting in, in Dublin, you might be looking down towards the power generation in Rings End. If you're in Cork, you might be looking towards Cork Harbour. Uh, Clare, you might look to Money Point. Uh, Kerry, you might look to Tarbert, for example. But our conventional fleet is by its nature um, limited in efficiency. So a typical, for example, I have, I'm showing here a combined cycle gas turbine might have a theoretical efficiency of around 65%. What that actually means is that 35% of the energy is, is lost. Um, so where does the energy go? Well, usually it's, it's taken off in the form of heat. And I remember many years ago being on a, a tour of, of one such facility and being in the control room. And I was showing, the controller was showing me how they were taking in, I think it was three tonnes of water a second and heating that up and then discharging it back to sea. So that was very much a function of the time where, where energy was cheap um, in today's climate where energy prices are are soaring where uh, energy efficiency is becoming paramount perhaps things like that are, are becoming uh, maybe um less appropriate as time goes on and we might need to look to combine our, our conventional uh, fleet with the likes of district heating etc or, or maybe using it in heating greenhouses etc so some way to reuse the the energy or to increase the efficiency According to the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, the average thermal plant in Ireland has an efficiency just over 50% on average, and that's increasing constantly as newer as older plant is retired, the newer plant is brought on, we find that the efficiency of the newer plant is, is getting better and better. So this is an area that is very much, um, I suppose, an area for, for change and improvement. Um, don't get me wrong, for a second, the conventional feed is absolutely essential. It is the backbone. It's needed, and there's no way that we can get away from it um, in the short term, uh, or or in the foreseeable future. So it's a case of maybe doing doing more with the energy we have, or perhaps using alternative fuels to help us again drive down the carbon emissions. The so the scene is set, I suppose, for the amount of energy that Ireland takes from renew uh, from uh, fossil fuel based, the amount that we take from renewables. And the the I suppose the the government, uh, the population, um, uh, the EU internationally, people are taking action. And I suppose, according to Einstein, I suppose I've put in a, a quotation here that the measure of intelligence is the ability to affect change. And we don't have to make huge changes; just we have to make incremental changes, small changes, one after another, to amount to those larger changes. And with that, I'm showing the sectorial emissions ceiling uh, publication there on screen. So I suppose the Climate Change Advisory Council has recommended, I suppose, carbon budgets, which are being adopted, which show, I suppose, give budgets for a five year period. And what they do is year on year, we have a particular carbon, I suppose, budget. And the idea is that over years, it successively trends down so that you have less and less emissions as time goes on. So we are taking action, we are moving forward, but I suppose um, also a measure of what you might do is a measure of what you have done. And with that, I suppose I'll have a look at Ireland's success in the integration of onshore wind. Um, on this slide, I'm showing the growth of onshore wind over the decades, and you can see to where we are today. Um, in the ROI, you have approximately four and a half gigawatts of installed wind which is quite considerable against a peak load of five, five and a half gigs there, thereabouts. Um, over the years, uh, we've had a, a number of different approaches to the integration of onshore wind. And we started with a gated approach. So we had gate one back in 2004, where you had, I suppose, 370 odd megawatts. Gate two then replaced it. And gate two had 1300 megawatts in 2006. Following that, we had, I suppose, gate three, and gate three was a combination of renewables and conventional plant. We had around about four gigs in that of renewables. That gave way to the non-GPA or non-group processing approach, which was in place for several years. And I suppose under the non-GPA approach, we had in the region of, I suppose, 1.8 gigs between wind and solar, um, there thereabouts. Um, and then that gave way to the current regime of enduring connection policy, ECP. With ECP at the end of, I suppose, uh, ECP 2.1, we're up pushing up nine odd gigs in the mix. So we're, we're moving upwards and upwards and upwards with onshore over the years, which is a tremendous success story for Ireland um, with our SNSP increasing year on year. And Ireland is very much looked to internationally as, as best in class with the integration of onshore for a small synchronous island network like our own. So if you look, I suppose, at the breakdown of renewables versus wind, you can see for the island, we have 
the vast majority of our renewables is coming from wind. Uh, the, the balance is made up maybe hydrogen or sorry, pardon me, um, hydro, bioenergy, etc. So wind has been the predominant success story over the years. Um, going forward, there are many other technology types that are going to come into uh, more focus for the likes of solar, etc. But I suppose what I'm showing here is up to now, wind has been, I suppose, the, the driver behind a lot of the decarbonization in the energy sector, the electricity energy sector. The way that we we got there was through a series of support schemes, uh, the first of which was REFIT, so the Renewable Energy Feed-in Tariff, which guaranteed a 15-year co year contract for the wind farms. And the contract had, a, I suppose, a price to the wind farms guaranteed of in the region there of 70-odd euros. Um, and then if the market price was below that agreed price, the wind farm or would be topped up by the PSO levy. So that was very fit for purpose for the time. That gave way to the current uh, renewable energy support scheme, which I suppose is a, uh, a successor. With the renewable energy support scheme, I suppose we have prices in there depending in and around 75 again, up to 97 odd euros. I suppose the difference between the two of these is that the renewable energy support scheme is a two-way contract for difference in that if the electricity price on the open market exceeds what the wind farm has agreed to operate at, it pays back into the PSO levy. The advantage of this is that it's seen as more sustainable in the long term. And when you have, I suppose, situations like we've seen in recent uh, weeks and months, whereby the energy um, prices have spiked on the wholesale market, then you actually have a situation where wind farms are paying back into the PSO levy, so putting downward pressure on prices. So that's been the model for onshore wind. We've very much been successful and seen success in that area over the years. But what wind and um, alternatives can do for you, so what renewable electricity can do is it can help you decarbonize those other sectors. So I showed Ireland's energy mix, I showed where our energy was going, uh, we had residential heating, transport, etc. So the beauty, I suppose, of technological advancements is that we can actually use our wind to help decarbonize these other sectors. What I'm showing here is an extract from a Wind Energy Ireland hydrogen report from the start of the year. And I'd encourage everybody to, to have a look at this document. It's an excellent report. And it shows very simply that you can use your offshore wind farm, combine it with uh, an electrolyzer and the beauty of electrolysis, which again is a technology type that is quite mature, always improving, but relatively mature. You can use this to produce hydrogen and obviously the byproduct then is oxygen. The hydrogen then we can use to, for example, feed into our national our, our gas grid or dedicated hydrogen grids. We can use it to power vehicles, whether they be hydrogen fuel cell, or we can use them use it to power conventional internal combustion engines. We can use it as a feedstock for industry. And if I'm showing down here at the table, I'm showing, for example, when I talk about using hydrogen to power um, internal combustion engines, you can actually, through the FT process, a well-established chemical process, you can combine your hydrogen with carbon dioxide to create hydrocarbons. So the same as we run our cars on, uh, basically uh, synthetic diesel. You can combine it with nitrogen uh, to create fertilizers, ammonia, through the Haber-Bosch -Bosch process. And again, these are well-established processes, so it can be done. And what the Wind Energy Ireland report has shown, it has given rough figures for how much wind, for example, you'd need. So take the natural gas example for about 4.2 gigawatts of wind. So about um, four offshore wind farms, you could displace 20% of the, the uh, natural gas demand in our network through, I suppose, this process. So basically using electricity to create other energy forms to decarbonize other energy sectors. So that's a real advantage of, of wind power. But obviously you can see the figures below there. You need an awful lot of wind for aviation, shipping, fertilizers, heavy goods vehicles, etc. So an awful lot of wind. Well, I suppose the next thing then is where would you go in the world to get wind? Uh, what I'm showing here is a graph, pardon me, is a heat map. And the heat map shows, I suppose, the wind across Europe. Heat map, the darker the color, the stronger the resource. And as we move up along the coast of Europe, I suppose up past the Bay of Biscay and up into, I suppose, the waters of Ireland, you can see that the color goes a dark purple. If you look across the continent, this dark purple, I suppose, follows up across Scotland into Norway before decreasing intensity again. So we are in 
part of the world which has the strongest wind resources, I suppose, in um, in the world and particularly in Europe, where is, I suppose, where we're located. Looking at the island or the, the landmass, you can see the color isn't as dark. So we do have a very good onshore wind resource, but it's not as strong as it would be at sea. So that's it. So that, that's the heat map. So what does a heat map look like, I suppose, in, in reality? So I'll play a small video. That's a video, I suppose, taken at Malin Head, and it just kind of gives you a sense of what that heat map translates into. You can even see the camera shaking. So there is an awful lot of energy out there if we can just capture that energy. And modern wind turbines are designed to capture up to 50% of the energy passing by them against a theoretical maximum of 59%. So they're very good at what they do. And the way that they do that is by when the wind hits the turbine, the wind actually slows down and passes the turbine um, and at a reduced velocity, then as it passes by the turbine before it gets to the next turbine, it basically picks up velocity again, pulling energy from the air over the turbines. So it regenerates itself over the space of several turbine widths. Um, so that's our wind resource for Ireland. I suppose what I'm showing here at the top of the screen is Brendan or St. Brendan, the navigator. So we, we have, I suppose, an ancient relationship with the sea as many, um, uh, island nations do. Uh, Irish people are generally very comfortable with the sea and we have I suppose the capacity factor at sea is much larger than it is at land on land so we can see a, a rough capacity factor of 45 percent. Now that's not to say that the wind turbine is is turning 45 percent of the time the actual turbine might be turning 90 percent of the time but that just shows you the amount of energy you're extracting I suppose on, on average. What I'm showing at the bottom of the screen is Ireland's unique um, positioning in Europe. So what I'm showing is um, what's termed the real map of Ireland, which shows Ireland's exclusive economic zone. And the exclusive economic zone is approximately seven times the landmass, as many people will be familiar with. What that means for Ireland is that we alone can extract the economic utility and value from this area, be it um, oil exploration, be it fisheries, or be it offshore renewable energy projects, for example. Now, the beauty, I suppose, of this is that offshore wind projects are seeing a rapid decrease in cost as they mature. And the National Renewable Energy Lab in Boulder, Colorado in the States has estimated costs dropping by up to 70% since inception. Now, if we look at where Ireland is, at the moment, we have one offshore wind farm operational, which is Arclo Bank. And when it came online, maybe 20 years ago, it was, I suppose, one of the biggest. You had 3.6 megawatt turbines, which were prototypes at the time. And Ireland very much was a leader in this area. But Ireland, like many other nations, paused in offshore wind. And I'm just showing here a picture of, of France. Um, from last month, uh, France commissioned its, or opened its first offshore wind farm. Whereas you think about it, so we're, we're 20 years ahead. The United States, a massive country, has only 40 odd megawatts, I suppose, but a lot more in development. So Ireland paused, many others paused as well in offshore wind. And the reasoning was very simple. Onshore wind was very much cheaper and more cross competitive over many years. So we went for the low hanging fruit. As offshore wind has matured, the costs have dropped. We're also reaching a point, I suppose, where many of the onshore sites um, have been exploited or are being exploited. So offshore wind is very much the next great frontier for not just for Ireland, but for our neighbours as well. I suppose it's probably appropriate to introduce, I suppose, offshore wind farms and what they look like, how they work and what they are. So a wind farm and a wind turbine, effectively, we have maybe 300,000 turbines around the world today. And um, what you have with an offshore context is effectively you have a turbine similar to what you will have onshore. You've got your nacelle, you've got your blades, you've got your rotor, um, you've got your tower. I suppose the difference is what happens from then on. You have a transition piece which joins your turbine onto the base. The base here is, is a monopile. And the vast majority of offshore wind farms have traditionally been constructed with monopile foundations. 
uh, approximately in a, around 80% are monopiles. The way that the monopile works is effectively you drive the pile deep into the seabed. Um, some of these uh, monopile foundations can be, uh, I suppose, upwards of maybe 100 meters um, for the bigger um, wind turbines. You're looking at effectively um, driving it in and then placing your wind turbine on top. What I'm showing uh, on this particular part is, uh, I suppose, a cross section of a wind turbine. With the wind turbine, you have traditionally three blades. Each blade can, I suppose, pitch independently. What that gives you effectively is speed control. When you go back into the nacelle, which is this section here, what I'm showing here is a gearbox. Not all my wind turbines have gearboxes. The vast majority, I suppose, of future offshore wind turbines are envisaged to move to what are called direct drive, direct drive machines. So what the gearbox effectively does, is it takes the rotation here, which might be 10, 15 RPM, and steps it up into the hundreds, and sometimes uh, over, over 100, up to maybe 1500 RPM to feed a generator. The generator then is connected to a transformer. You can have power electronics, and the power is exported, I suppose, from the turbine down. The way that it tends to work, or the way that it's envisaged, is you have wind picks up gradually at a particular cut end speed. The power for the wind turbine increases up to rated maximum, which is rated by the generator and components inside. When you hit rated maximum, you pitch the blades to maintain the velocity constantly. When you get into a very high wind speed scenario, you go into what's called high wind speed shutdown, whereby you literally turn the turbine off. And you do that by pivoting the blades completely. So each one of these can be independently controlled. You can stop the turbine by pivoting a single blade. So you literally have triple redundancy, um, which makes them safe by design. As well as that, you have braking internally here. You break in the gearbox. You have a brake actually on the shaft coming back. So there's multiple ways to stop the turbine from moving in a high wind speed scenario. So when we talk about offshore wind, um, this is typically what we're looking at. This is a, a diagram that I'm showing whereby we start with our monopile here, which is the vast majority of offshore wind farms are monopile foundation. So monopile is generally used in shallower waters. As we move into deeper waters, you'll see a jacket foundation as shown here become more common. And a lot of this is based on economics. So what's the cheapest to install? <clears throat> with a jacket, you have effectively, depending on the seabed, you can have again, small monopiles at the base of the jacket coming down. So small piles driven at the seabed. You can have suction, um, to hold it in place. There's multiple different anchoring techniques depending on your seabed te uh, topology or your seabed composition. As we go into deeper waters, there are different types of design. I'm showing here, I suppose, a twisted jacket technology. But I think it's fair to say that there are probably tens of designs that you could use for fixed bottom. And the designs are changing, always pushing the frontiers, pushing the boundaries, and pushing us into deeper waters. But there comes a point where you transition and it becomes no longer economically viable to have a fixed bottom turbine. And in a situation like that, you're looking at a floating technology. What I'm showing on the screen here is three types of floating technology. The first of which is a called semi-submersible. So this is your semi-sub. The semi-sub is effectively, as, as the name says, some of it is under the water, some of it is above the water, and it's floating. It's tethered to the seabed. And again, the anchoring technique is dependent on the seabed and the composition. Another design shown is the, I suppose, tension leg. And with the tension leg platform, what you have is the buoyancy of the forces up or counteracted by forces down through the anchoring system. If we go into, I suppose, another design again, we have the spar. The spar is very similar to think of uh, a seven up bottle, take an empty seven up bottle, put the end, fill the end with sand. And that's effectively what a spar is. And you can put your wind turbine on top of the spar. Again, I think it's, it's fair to say that there are tens of designs for floating and the designs are always changing. I've heard it described as a bit of a technological gold rush in that multiple companies are rushing into this market, uh, building on the research that's been done over decades to try to find the optimum um, type of structure for the seabed composition, as well as the local environment, supply chain, et cetera. Floating is interesting in that the power supplies, the power cables are brought down through what are called dynamic cables. So while the structure is anchored to the seabed, you have the power being brought down through buoyant cables. And typically for the Irish 
context, you'd expect those to hit the seabed where they'll be buried. As deeper water in deeper waters, you may not always see these buried, but for the Irish, um, I suppose, landscape, our water depths are, are reasonably manageable. So with that, I'm going to play a small video just to explain to you a little bit about the floating technology. How do offshore wind farms work? This innovative technology marks a milestone in the development of renewable energy. The power of the wind is far greater, more stable and constant at sea than it is on land. And it has been this fact that has been the driving force behind offshore wind energy over the last few years. But not all sites are suitable for installing this technology upon fixed structures anchored to the seabed. Fixed structure wind farms cannot be developed in areas which are too deep or which have complicated seabed conditions. But thanks to innovation, it is now possible to build floating wind facilities. These complexes are made up of wind turbines installed on oscillating platforms anchored to the seabed using flexible mooring elements, chains or steel cables. The force of the wind turns the rotor blades. The wind turbine converts their speed into energy and that energy is transported by undersea cables to an offshore substation that increases the voltage so that the electricity can be sent over long distances to the coast, where it passes through another substation, this time onshore, which transforms it to be transported through electricity power lines to our homes and businesses. The advantages of floating wind power include less invasive activity on the seabed during installation and ease of installation due to the turbines being built and assembled on land before being towed out to sea already mounted on their respective floating platforms. Furthermore, this enables full advantage to be taken of the strong winds that blow across the deeper areas, thereby improving the energy generating performance. Floating offshore wind power gives us clean, inexhaustible energy for a more sustainable planet. Okay, so that gives you a flavor for floating technology. And when those cables come down and they hit the seabed, um, you generally have what we refer to as um, inter-array cabling, and that collects the power from all of the individual wind turbines so for a fixed bottom, for example, as I'm showing here, this is the, the London Array. Each one of these is a wind turbine, and you can see that they are connected in a daisy chain back to that offshore substation. The offshore substations then are sending the power back to shore among, along a much, I suppose, higher voltage cable. The, I suppose, configuration of these varies, and there's no one set design. You might have six to eight per string, depends if it goes low as four. It, it all depends on the optimization for the site. Again, the voltages for these, traditionally 33 kV, we're seeing them increase to 66 kV and could double again well by the end of the decade. So all of this infrastructure needs to be buried. All of that is gonna disappear into the seabed for, I suppose, a minimal impact, as well as, uh, I suppose, maximizing the, um, uh, the protection for the cabling system. When the cabling comes ashore, there's a number of different ways to do it. What I'm showing here, I suppose, is open cut trenching where you bring it in along a beach. That's not the only way. You can do what's called horizontal directional drilling where you might drill in, for example, if you have a small cliff face, you can drill in past that obstacle. And when it comes ashore, it comes in and transitions through a transition joint bay to a traditional onshore cabling system going along, hitting an onshore substation where it's exported to our national grid. Now, you also have an O&M facility located in the vicinity, it may not necessarily be at the seashore, but in the vicinity. The cabling looks something like this, so a three-core cable with a fiber optic communication channel embedded in, inside. So offshore wind, I suppose, is very much coming of age. Um, we, and I mean we in the European context, are world leading in offshore wind. UK and um, particularly GB again is, is very much leading in this area with the largest fixed bottom, the largest floating wind farms in the world. From a European context, you're talking about, I suppose, you know, tens of gigawatts installed, thousands of turbines. From a European context, again, well over 100 wind farms and in 2021, about 17 billion investment. 
what I'm showing is a trajectory. So where we are now, so for example, in a region of say 30 odd gigs installed, and you can see that ramping up very, very aggressively towards the end of the decade across all of these different countries. What I put in here is an interactive map. If anybody wants to have a look at that, um, take the link. It's, it's a brilliant map where you can see all of Europe. You can see every single wind farm that's in operation. You can click on it, find out when it was built, the amount of turbines, the owner, et cetera. It's, it's a great resource. So anybody who's interested, I encourage you to have a look at that and find out more. So I wanted to show one of the beauties of, I suppose, having a massive exclusive economic zone like we do. Now, the Kinsale gas terminals were there for many decades, and I bet that not a lot of people might have seen them. And they were, I suppose, taking advantage of this over the horizon phenomenon, whereby if you go far enough away, you basically drop down over the horizon. And depending on the size of the infrastructure, you have to go different direct or different uh, distances out. But I suppose it's a it's an economic optimization problem, whereby the further out you go, obviously you have less visual impact, but you have more cabling out, which means the higher cost of installation, which needs to be recouped through the electricity customer. So it's a, it's a balance that you're trying to find. But I suppose it does have the capacity. Potentially, floating wind is ideally suited for this because traditionally, as you or or in general, as you go further out, you hit deeper water depths, so you can leverage against floating technology to push your infrastructure over the horizon, whereby it might have a le less of a visual impact. Now, floating technology is very much borrowing from oil and gas. What I'm showing here on the left-hand picture here is, I suppose, a traditional um, gas rig, oil rig on a spar foundation. If you look here, this is a floating wind turbine, again, on a spar foundation. The design is very similar with the spar on both sides. The forces are quite different with a wind turbine. You can imagine the wind hitting it here. So the force is pushing it this way. So again, the forces down along the spar will be different to in this situation. However, you're leveraging heavily of decades of experience in oil and gas in the energy sector, bringing that experience over to renewable energy. And floating wind is definitely not new. There have been pilot projects for many, many years. And the first, I suppose, was classified by many as a full-scale demo of a commercial-scale wind turbine. It was back in, I suppose, 2009. And you had the High Wind Pilot Project uh, assembled in Norway and, I suppose, operating in Scotland. Uh, the, it was succeeded by the 30-megawatt High Wind Park, which is five, six megawatts machine and operation since 2017 and is delivering the highest capacity factor of any offshore wind farm in the UK. Scotland also holds the record, I suppose, of the largest floating wind farm at the moment of 50 odd megawatts with Kincardier soon to be overtaken with Norway is actively constructing an almost a 90 megawatt floating facility. So we're going up and up as, as the time goes on. Again, I mentioned NREL, National Renewable Energy Labs, um, and I read in one of their documents that um, there's an expectation that we will see price convergence, I suppose, in the next number of years between this technology and traditional fixed bottom technology. The UK is very much world leading when it comes to offshore wind and floating offshore wind as well. The UK, I suppose, has set a target, as I'm showing here, five gigawatts floating by 2030, ring fenced, I suppose, a particular pot to incentivize floating. And I think it's nice to show that, I suppose, um, floating has come in relatively price compar uh, competitive in and around 90 odd pounds per megawatt hour in the recent auction. The, there's many other countries that have set ambitious targets for floating Spain. I'm showing, I suppose, uh, US states here. But if you look across the board, there's various targets being set, various jurisdictions looking. And um, France is another one I've just brought to, uh, I suppose, attention here. There's an excellent document that I'd advise anyone to look up. You know, the catapult documents are an actual, an excellent resource. And if you look there, there's projections, I suppose, going out for the UK, various different scenarios. And again, you're seeing the growth of floating um, again and again, going from strength to strength. It's very much maturing in a coming of age of the technology, uh, leveraging larger turbines, uh, stronger winds as you go out further from shore, and very much, I suppose, an area that is coming, up and coming. Um, the legislative framework and the governance structure for Ireland is very much uh, an active work in progress. For anybody 
who may have, I suppose, seen um, announcements of particular um, vendors withdrawing from, from the network due to maybe uh, slow action on particular parts. I think that they need to have a look and see and appreciate just the amount of work that's going in to setting the correct framework, getting the policies right. Each one of these documents, and this isn't even an ex exhaustive list, are hundreds of pages long, very, very complex. And it's important that we get the regulatory framework, we get the governance structure right, because this isn't an industry for 2030. This is an industry that will be enduring well out to 2050 and possibly beyond, depending, I suppose, on technological advances or innovations or where renewable energy goes. So there's an awful lot of work being done. And there's an awful lot of political goodwill when it comes to the offshore wind sector. Um, I think government is very committed to it. All parties are very committed to it. And I'm just going to play a small little uh, video here um, from, I suppose, on Taoiseach, uh, Mio Martin, when he opened our offices earlier in the year. And it just gives you a flavour, I suppose, of the political engagement and goodwill that the industry is seeing from, I suppose, um, a political uh, parties at the moment. Absolutely delighted to open the office and uh, also witness the joint venture between Iberdrola and DP Energy, which has been here for quite a, a lot of years now in the Cork region, because this is the future of the country. Uh, this is the future of the, of, of the world in terms of renewable energy, and uh, DP Energy and uh, Iberdrola are involved in a very exciting uh, program uh, in terms of offshore wind, uh, and particularly floating wind technology. Uh, they have a long-term uh, vision uh, in terms of, of that uh, renewable energy and it's something that dovetails with the government's objective through the Climate Action Low Carbon Development Bill uh, and also um, our objectives around offshore um, energy. All of this is coming together at the right time in the opening of this office, the development of the legislation uh, and the need to really power this uh, sector which will create new jobs, create a new economy uh, into the future. There's tremendous energy there to be exploited. It's the obvious option for Ireland. We're one of the windiest places on the planet, particularly off our coastlines. And uh, we want to get to 80% renewable electricity uh, by 2030. We're currently at 43%. Um, so the offshore wind piece is very important and is central to us realizing uh, that ambition. And government is moving as fast as it possibly can now on this front. The private sector is as well as evidenced by this joint venture uh, and the opening of this office, office here in Cork Docklands. Okay, so that, that kind of gives you a sense, I suppose, of um, the movement uh, in government towards decarbonizing and the goodwill, I suppose, that's there towards the um, offshore wind sector. And I suppose we started talking about climate change, and I suppose we're all very well aware of the climate emergency and what that translates to in, I suppose, the climate action plan from 2021. We, again, are, are waiting the update of this um, in the near future. But what we looked at or what we saw was renewable energy at 80%, I suppose I'd mentioned onshore wind at the start, the growth of onshore wind, continued growth of onshore wind, as well as that, at least five gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. And that at least is important because when we were setting the sectorial emissions targets, um, government made the uh, decision to set, I suppose, a figure around that at least and set it at seven gigawatts. And the seven gigawatts allowed for, I suppose, two gigawatts of green hydrogen. And again, we talked earlier about using green hydrogen to decarbonize other areas. So again, that two gigawatts of green hydrogen can be used for a multitude of different applications. Um, so again, e-fuels, ammonia, pure hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cells, uh, export, etc. So it's a tremendous potential. And while this may be setting a target for 2030, the story certainly doesn't stop at 2030. If you look last month, I suppose, the North Sea's Energies Cooperation met in Dublin. And again, this is headed, uh, currently chaired, I suppose, by, by Ireland. This is a consortium or a group of countries listed here. And they agreed and they set targets for 2050, as you can see on screen. 
The I'll draw your attention really in red to the Irish target, which is, I suppose, our area of keen interest. So you can see that we had the seven gigs for 2030, moving out to up to 20 gigs by 2040 and settling at just under 40, 37 gigs by 2050 is the current targets that were set. Other countries are following suit and you can see the other countries have similarly ambitious targets. So Ireland is certainly, certainly not an outlier here. Uh, with this group of countries, we expect the UK to soon rejoin. And again, the numbers will just, uh, I suppose, grow even, even greater again. So again, um, very much an area of growth over not the coming decade, but over the coming decades. And again, I mentioned, I suppose, a, a government structure. Anybody working in the industry at the moment is seeing an awful lot of consultations from all of the different key stakeholders, be they the department, uh, be they the regulator, um, be they the TSOs, SEM committees, etc. So a lot of the consultations are, again, engaging with industry and asking industry's opinion, um, as well as all the different stakeholders in how do we set the regulatory framework up so that this is an industry that is fit for purpose, that has everything in place to deliver, I suppose, over the coming years. A tremendous amount of work happening here. And certainly anybody working in the industry, will this will be a part of their, their day job in terms of um, responding to consultations, etc. So Ireland for offshore wind has, I started talking about the gated approach that we had for onshore wind back Gate, gate one, gate two, gate three, for example, well, very analogous to what's happening for offshore wind, we have a phased approach, phasing very similar to gating. So the, I suppose, policy statement on the framework for offshore wind outlined three distinct phases with accompanying auctions or res auctions. The first phase is, I suppose, based on early mover projects, projects that were already in motion, um, projects that were significantly advanced. And those projects, I suppose, are deemed, um, I suppose, to be, uh, I suppose, first movers. They are targeting pre-2030 energization, and there's in and around oh, four gigs, give or take, depends, I suppose, how much consents, et cetera. So that's very much the first phase. Anything that may not be successful the first phase will be expected maybe to move to the second phase. Uh, second phase is where, uh, I suppose, the projects for DP and Iberdrola and many others are. The second phase, again, is targeting 2030. A second phase, again, are very advanced. Many of the projects are very advanced. I mentioned that we have our environmental impact assessment scoping report documents out. Uh, so many, I suppose, phase two developers are, are racing ahead. Uh, I suppose you could say on, on the heels of the, the phase one. Or on the, so again, 2030 energization. And following that, you're looking at phase three, which is the more enduring or long-term post-2030 uh, regime. There is, I suppose, an awful lot of... Um, information out there on this, the phase two, the, I suppose, framework for phase two was consulted on at the end of last year. And we're waiting, I suppose, industry is waiting for that, the result of that to be published again, it's expected in the very near future. So phase one is our model to, to look at for now. And the phase one process, the way that it works really is that phase one developers will look for a maritime area consent, which is a seabed lease. The phase one developers have got their seabed leases now uh, signed off by the minister, I suppose uh, Minister Ryan, and the phase twos will expected to be given a seabed lease through the new Maritime Area Regulatory Authority, which is being set up. And once you have your seabed lease, that is effectively your right to put your turbines on, on the sea. Um, you have, importantly, a grid connection. Can you export your power? Where is your power going for the phase one? So you have grid connection. The two of these components allows you to enter a renewable energy support scheme auction for offshore, whereby you can finance your project or guarantee financing. In parallel to that, you should be looking for planning permission to consent your project. So all of this then will, once you have your, I suppose, your route to market, once you have your development consents, then this allows you to get a final grid connection offer and progress your project. I've given some approximate timelines down at the bottom of the screen here for the phase one projects. So this is very much, I suppose, um, our model for now. Phase two, we uh, will see uh, probably next month all going well. So I talked maybe about the, uh, I suppose, the potential of Ireland. Well, many developers internationally have seen the potential. 
And it's estimated, this is from, I suppose, the National Port Study, again, a Wind Energy Ireland and, and GDG, uh, an excellent report uh, for anybody who hasn't seen it, where you see, I suppose, the active development. And I've added in on the screen here, maybe the areas and the, the megawatts in development. But really, you're seeing about 30-odd, uh, circa 30 gigawatts for development pre-2030. And if you think about that, it sounds, I suppose, like a lot, but the recent Crown Estate auctions for Scotland had 25 gigs, so it's not outlandish. However, I suppose I did mention earlier that um, we have a target of seven gigawatts. So whether all of this consents or not, I suppose it, it's wait, we'll wait and see whether there's a hydrogen consultation response that is pending. So there'll be a hydrogen strategy for Ireland. We'll see whether some of these megawatts can go directly to hydrogen. So I suppose there's a lot of people in the industry waiting, um, I suppose, for clarity. But if you think about it from a, an Ireland Inc. perspective, the opportunity that this picture actually holds, uh, take a rule of thumb, maybe as a benchmark. Um, I know the Sea Green project in Scotland, uh, offshore wind farm, about 1.1 gigawatts is in and around three and a half billion. So if you say a rule of thumb, 300 megawatts might be a billion of investment, then all of this building is, you know, investments in the tens of billions, you know, and it represents a tremendous opportunity for Ireland, particularly for supply chain, if that we can do, if we can capitalize to make sure that the maximum benefit from this returns to Ireland through, I suppose, the stimulation of, of uh, local supply chain primarily, as well as a long-term return for the Irish state through the leasing of the seabed uh, to making sure that the Irish people, I suppose, see a benefit from the investment. So moving on, maybe to build out this type of infrastructure, you might have heard a lot talked about ports. Well, if you think for a second about floating infrastructure in particular, floating infrastructure is assembled in port and towed out. So you have, I suppose, a floating base, on this, you build your turbines inshore and pull them to sea. Now, if you think about the size of them, I'll come to that maybe in the next slide, but if you look at storage even, these are your blades here. Your blades um, might be, I suppose, 100 meters long, depending on the size of the turbine. You have all the tower pieces, you have the nacelles, etc. So all of this needs to be stored, ideally in an Irish port in the vicinity of your wind farm. And again, a tremendous opportunity for stimulation of jobs, et cetera. But if you think about the sizing of these, so for, for example, a 20 megawatt machine, we're looking at perhaps um, a height of up to 170 meters up to the, the hub, um, tip heights are considerably higher. The weight you're talking about, so for the nacelle, you're talking about a weight of maybe 90 tons. You could have um, between the nacelle and I suppose when you put the blades on, et cetera, you could have this part alone weighing a thousand tons. So to construct that, you need a crane that's high enough. You need one that can bear an appropriate load. The size of the key side there, that needs to be able to take, you know, you're talking about a thousand ton loading. So you need ports that are fit for purpose, large, and can, I suppose, feed the engine that is these offshore wind turbines. So if you're talking about gigawatts, that's a 20 megawatt machine, for example, five of those for 100 megawatts, you need a lot of turbines. And I've talked a little bit, I suppose, about the size of these. Well, just to give you a little taste of it, the wind turbine sizes are constantly increasing. And whereby you might be installing today, you know, 12 megawatt machines or even less smaller machines. There was even two years ago talk that by 2030, you'll be installing 15 megawatt machines. But if you meet manufacturers today and you talk to them, this, they're looking at putting upwards of 20 megawatt machines or in and around 20 megawatt machines. And again, it's very simple that bigger is cheaper. Studies have shown that the bigger your turbines get, your offshore wind farm cost drops and drops. And the reason is that you need, I suppose, less turbines installed, your installed vessels are on site for less time, you need less cabling, etc. So the reasons, I suppose, become uh, so bigger is, is better. But you look at the scale of this, this is the Eiffel Tower, a 20 megawatt machine is, is comparable. What I'm showing here is installation for a wind farm. You can see these are the monopile structures pre-installed. And this is uh, one of the amazing vessels that you need to install offshore wind. This is a jackup vessel. So it's basically a mobile crane on stilts. It comes next to where you're installing the turbine and literally jacks itself up and installs your turbine off a vessel, the same vessel or an adjacent vessel. 
Um, if you think about the complexity, even on the in the, on the ship alone, with the ship alone, it's it's staggering. And wind turbines themselves are deceptively straightforward. A wind turbine, I've heard likened to an aircraft in terms of the complexity of when you go into it and everything that's in it. So from a global supply chain issue, um, even down to the ships you're providing, the amount of ships that you need, you need survey vessels, you need install vessels, transport vessels for your foundations, cable laying vessels, boulder clearing vessels. You need, well, I'm just showing here, giving you a flavor of the amount of specialized vessels you need. And there's only a limited number of these in the world. And I was at a very interesting webinar from Wind Energy Ireland in the last few weeks, whereby they interviewed or talked to the companies that supply these vessels. And my key takeaway from it was that they were saying that maybe five years ago, they'd be tendering for work. Whereas today they are not so much turning work away, but picking and choosing. So the supply, or sorry, the demand far is out, out stripping the supply. And plus, when you're talking about 20 megawatt machines that haven't even been built yet, when they're ordering new ships, what ships do they order? What size do they order for? They don't want to order a custom ship to be built for a 20 megawatt machine when it can soon be replaced with something bigger. So again, there's a lot of uncertainty there. But the point is, specialist vessels are needed. There's a huge international demand and they need to be available in time. So I'm shown here maybe a slide with some of the risks. Uh, for offshore wind in Ireland. The first one I mentioned is the ports, and we touched on ports. Second one is the availability of workers and skilled workers. So you need everybody involved in the supply chain uh, and the construction side of it, the design, et cetera. You need uh, environmental, uh, you need ecologists, you need engineers, you need every discipline, and you need lots of them. So there's a risk that we don't have enough, I suppose, workers. The install vessels I explained and touched on, supply chain, if you looked at the international context, the amount of these wind turbines being installed and scheduled to be installed, again, like I mentioned, the US, they've set a 30 gigawatt target for 2030. So supply chain, have we enough turbines? Um, grid capacity. So for example, our neighbors in the UK for their decarbonization journey are looking at the investment of perhaps hundreds of billions to upgrade their national grid to electrify as much as possible. So um, will our grid be there in time? Evolving consenting processes. So how we strike the balance between environmental conservation and uh, energy, uh, providing decarbonized energy. The maritime area consent, uh, the speed of development for MAC. Investor confidence. Um, again, all of those investors see a potential for Ireland but if you think of the likes of maybe the Shells and the BPs and the traditional energy firms, their dividends pay perhaps 20% of, say, GB pensions. So investors need returns. Otherwise, that's the reward for investment. So can we guarantee the confidence that they'll get those returns so that they don't go to other markets? Um, engagement with the relevant bodies. Are the relevant bodies resourced appropriately so that they can engage with the industry? And again, there's a huge staff shortage across all sectors from the people that we deal with um, through all sectors of the supply chain and I suppose the regulatory framework, the government bodies, et cetera, everybody is looking for people um, to work in this emerging area. And again, route to market, again, I mentioned the potential for hydrogen, um, renewable energy support scheme. We're looking at seven gigawatt target with maybe 30 gigawatts that will build if we can give it a route to market. There's some of the risks, but you know, with risks, there's also opportunities. And some of the opportunities I mentioned, a risk becomes an opportunity, the opportunity for local jobs. Like I mentioned the Kinsale gas terminal. You think of the energy density from gas, you needed a relatively small workforce to run a massive energy infrastructure project. Offshore wind is quite labor intensive in that every turbine needs to be maintained. You need people visiting it annually, greasing, um, inspecting, running checks. So you need a lot of people. So local jobs, they need to be based in the locality, not too far from the wind turbines to minimize transport time, et cetera. There's an opportunity for community benefit. So effectively communities can benefit, particularly if you have ORES um, requirements for particular monetary benefits for um, maybe educational facilities or uh, educational funding for local communities, be it uh, schools, be it um, playgrounds, et cetera. Energy security is a big one. Ireland has one of the highest energy imports of all of the EU countries. We're well above the EU average, but every 
uh, indigenous energy source drops our dependence on imported fossil fuels, which again are subject to um, geopolitical tensions and issues beyond our control. Environment, I started with environment, so the environmental issues are clear. Uh, international investment, a great opportunity for Ireland to capitalize on the investment that's wet, uh, I suppose available to us. You can see certain parts, particularly the developing world, might be, I suppose, very much crying out for investment, whereas we have, I suppose, an abundance of it, which is a, an opportunity. Uh, the hydrogen economy, I mentioned the potential to be world leading and a potential for an export economy. So with that, I'm coming to the end of the presentation. And if I was to try to, I suppose, um, in one word, sum up offshore wind in Ireland, I think the word I would use for it is, is boarding. The wind industry is, is ready, move our bags packed, we're ready to take off. And it's just a case of, I suppose, getting on the plane and getting, getting the industry moving. And with that, I suppose the presentation is, is drawing to a close. I started with, I suppose, Rostell and Dahlman. And again, I'll, I'll finish with it because for me, it's very much a question of the climate emergency. Uh, it's not a straightforward problem. It's a highly complex problem. You have some of the best minds in the world across uh, you know, all different sectors looking at how we solve this problem. But the only thing that I do know is that you know, our time is running out. And if we don't solve the problem within our lifetimes, whatever way we do that, then, you know, this might have been built two, three hundred generations ago. Well, the generations two, three hundred generations from now will live with the problems that we leave them. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any of your questions. Okay, um, just looking at some of the questions here. Uh, okay, one is, okay, talking about the transfer of loads or do you see France, Ireland with DC interconnection links? So I think this is doing, dealing with the super grid. So, um, okay, so, uh, from uh, an offshore perspective, uh, a supergrid is definitely something that is beneficial. If you if you look at the UK, for example, there is very much talk of uh, increased interconnection throughout the end or towards the end of the decade. And it's shown that increased interconnection, I suppose, is one way that you can drive down the costs by, I suppose, um, linking the markets or linking the electricity markets. There's talk about, I suppose, multi-terminal uh, HVDC where you have offshore nodes. And again, we are very much in a wait and see perspective. So for the phase ones, it's following a traditional approach whereby you build your wind farm, you connect it in. We're waiting to see, I suppose, what the enduring regime might look like. There's talk, I suppose, of a centrally planned approach. And again, there's consultations happening. So the industry is, is evolving. We, we'll wait to see, I suppose, what happens there. Um, okay. At what RPM is the shaft retained, assisted by variable pitch of the blades? Okay, so the the speed of the wind turbine it, it varies depending on the different uh, technology type. But you would say on in general you might have a speed going up to around fifteen hundred RPM. Uh, it goes through the gearbox, which steps it up. You have different speeds of gearbox, so you can have a variable or, or different sizes of gearbox and different types depending. And I mentioned that they are being phased out, I suppose. But if you have a gearbox, sometimes you'll step up to maybe 300 RPM. Or if you have a high-speed gearbox, you could step up to maybe 1500 RPM. And again, the generator then runs at that. What you will often have then is power electronics. So the generator produces AC power. The power electronics then will take that AC power, convert it to DC. Uh, you convert it then back into AC uh, for export to the grid. So if you, I showed a picture of the interarray cabling. So your wind turbine might be outputting at say 3.3 kV. Your interarray cabling at the moment might be 33 kV. So you step up for the interarray cabling. And then again, that comes back to your central, I suppose, offshore substation where you, you step up again. So the power electronics effectively match what the wind turbine is producing and what the interarray cabling is expecting. And power electronics, I suppose, are, uh, I suppose it's using the same type of technology as you might have in traditional power electronics, you know, um, AC, DC, AC converters. So you have to be mindful with that, that you don't get, I suppose, uh, a waveform that creates too much distortion and you'll have a 
most likely a requirement depending on your technology type for I suppose harmonic filtering to make sure that your power quality issues are, are managed appropriately. Okay, that's one question. Can you provide the link to the interactive map? Okay, I can put it into the chat function in a, in a moment. That's been done. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, assuming the fishing is prohibited underneath the offshore wind turbine, is it possible to construct a fish or crustacean nursery underneath so that local fisheries benefit? Okay. Um, fisheries is an obvious um, issue, I suppose, when it comes to offshore wind. And that's why the government has set up an ORE, so offshore wind seafood working group, looking at the specific issue. What I'll say is that we're waiting to see what comes out of that, but international uh, best practice and international experience teaches that fishing and offshore wind farms aren't mutually exclusive. And again, I go back to the Kinsale gas field because it's, I suppose, our one of our only or was one of our, our longest serving offshore energy infrastructures. That that exercise an exclusion zone. So if you were out of a recreational vessel, you couldn't get within so many meters of that, so many hundred meters of that. Traditionally, or with offshore wind farms, that's not necessarily the case. So when you have a crew transfer vessel, which is bringing the crew to the wind turbine to maintain it, what they actually do is they drive up to the turbine, they power on and they press into it. So I don't know if anybody has ever been possibly to the Schelligs, but you can see where the boat comes up next to the rock and you, you come next to it and you hop off. It's very similar with an offshore wind turbine. And the point I'm making there is that boats in close proximity to the turbines, particularly if you have fixed bottom, for example, a monopile going down, they're not, there's no immediate issue. And as well, you have, I suppose, an air draft at the bottom of the turbine comes down and normally it could be maybe 30 meters above sea level. So there's a limited risk of that striking a vessel because it's so high. Um, and again, experience has shown, my understanding is like with the Arklow Bank phase, uh, phase one project that it's actually used as a, as a marker for, for racing. Uh, yachts around so there's no there's no problem with driving vessels in the proximity of it i showed the interray cabling network and i showed the fact that you have what was a daisy chain of those cables now those cables are buried and the the, the depth is i suppose uh, based on a cable burial risk assessment and that cable uh, depth provided that it's sufficiently deep you'll protect the cable but if you're doing some form of fishing whereby you're actively dredging the seabed you may have a risk so again of damaging that cable so again i would say that the likes of potting for example lobster fishing etc definitely no problem you can go and you can do your potting um but if you think about something perhaps the where you're where you're trawling near uh, cabling etc then there may there may be a consideration but i suppose the thing is that it's an area that's being actively looked at government is actively looking at it and i think you definitely see a situation whereby the industry is very much looking to find uh, the best solution for all parties anybody discommoded should be i suppose uh, you know held whole in terms of if your fishing ground is affected and you have to move somewhere else then there has to be some community gain or benefit you know for any affected parties so the industry is working very hard with key stakeholders and our even our own uh, you know community liaison officer um fisheries etc we're forever on, on the piers talking to people understanding their concerns to bring it back because particularly the phase twos we're at the stages where we're actively designing our our, our construct our designing what we will construct and we can bring that feedback you know into our design considerations and it'll be a part of our environmental impact assessment as well the impact on commercial fisheries um okay we're running over time jeffrey so i think that'll be our final question okay final question um uh, so many questions which to choose from <laughs> um so again just one question is in terms of energy storage how do we overcome the problems of energy storage and again energy storage is a massive problem for variable uh, renewables and it is at the moment when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine we rely on conventionals and conventionals are seen as the uh I suppose they're going to be there for the near term at least uh longer term there's a role perhaps for conventionals transitioning to biomethane there's a role for conventionals transitioning to hydrogen blends as a backup you can produce the hydrogen from the offshore wind again battery storage the cost is coming down uh, we can see battery storage forming a, a greater part of the of this puzzle as we as we go forward. Uh, there's the potential for, I suppose, uh, storage of hydrogen in e-fuels, in ammonia. You have compressed uh, compressed air. Um, really, it's it's a huge area of active research. 
Again, another area is potentially carbon capture and storage. If you have a conventional uh, uh, something that's run, for example, if you have a conventional uh, CCGT and you run that in biomethane, couple that with carbon capture and storage and you're actually carbon negative, you're not carbon neutral. So there's piles of research being done. There's plenty of answers as to how we might power, I suppose, when the wind isn't blowing. But hydrogen is definitely, definitely seen as a big part of the solution at the moment in terms of the current, current thinking. So that's my last question, I think. I think, um, Chris, um, am I to uh, come in at this stage? That's fine. You can fire away now, uh, Seamus. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think this evening we have been very fortunate uh, to have an expert such as Jeffrey advising us and informing us about uh, this very topical subject. Um, it's well known we are in the midst of an energy crisis. We have an ever increasing global um, population and that population has an almost insatiable appetite for energy. So the demand for energy is increasing all the time. Hence, Jeffrey's presentation this evening is very topical. He has advised us uh, in relation to all aspects of uh, wind uh, generation, the present status, the problems, the risks, the opportunities, the technology and regulatory situation. My first experience with wind um, generators was in the 1970s on an, uh, a west of Ireland uh, offshore island. We had a small uh, generator, a couple of kilowatts, um, and uh, it lasted for about a week before a storm destroyed it. So I'm very pleased to see that the technology has moved on and we can now have workable long-term um, multi-megawatt generators working offshore. One of uh, Jeffrey's slides um, intrigued me, and that was the one about the wind profile uh, globally. And uh, that um, showed that the wind profile around Northern Scandinavia show, is, is much less wind than around Ireland. And the thought occurred to me, is there any threat from climate change that would give rise to reducing wind uh, around the Irish coast. However, it's just a thought. Um, what Geoffrey has, I think, uh, advised us is that um, we have perhaps an opportunity to keep the elephant in the room, nuclear energy, uh, at bay. If we can develop sufficient um, renewables, which includes wind generation. And again, I, I wondered, was there any future for micro generation uh, where loads of small solar and wind energy uh, generators could be combined into the grid? Uh, is it a pipe dream? Is it something that's realistic? So uh, Jeffrey has given us a very informative presentation. He is also provided a very entertaining uh, presentation um, with very excellent uh, illustrations. So Jeffrey, on behalf of all participants and on behalf of the IET, it gives me very great pleasure to propose this vote of thanks to you. Thank you for an excellent, topical, informative and entertaining presentation. Back to you, Ching. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you very much for your um, excellent presentation. And thank you, uh, Seamus, for the full of thanks. Now, I'd like to pass it back to Chris, Chris, to close the, um, the webinar. Chris. Thanks again, Jeff, for an excellent presentation. And here's looking forward to seeing all of you at our upcoming webinars. So goodbye for now.
Goodbye.